All right, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Gravity Goldberg. Gravity Goldberg is an international educational consultant and author of five, oops, sorry, I lost my, of five other books on teaching. Mindsets and Moves put her on the world stage with its practical ways to cultivate student agency, leading to speaking engagements and foreign translations of her work. She has more than 20 years of teaching experience, including positions as a science teacher, reading specialist, third grade teacher, special educator, literacy coach, staff developer, assistant professor, educational consultant, and yoga teacher. <laughs> I think you've hit them all, Gravity. <laughs> Gravity holds a BA and a master's of education from Boston College and a doctorate in education from Teachers College, Columbia University. She currently serves as a coach for Seth Godin's Alt MBA and is a founding director of Gravity Goldberg LLC, a team that provides side-by-side -side coaching for teachers. Thank you so much for being with us today, Gravity. And with that, I will turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Megan. And thanks everyone for joining us. It's exciting to see people from all over. I forgot to put that I am in Connecticut right now, not far from some of the folks that I also know uh, we're on the chat. So we're gonna be talking today about active learning. And before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to honor my co-author um, on our book that's coming out, Barry Gilmore. Unfortunately, Barry passed away during the writing of this book. Um, luckily, we did get to outline and do a lot of the planning and he definitely got a lot of the writing done. But I wanted to just take a moment to honor that he would have been here with me side by side, making us laugh and learn together. And I'm really sorry he's not here with us um, in person, but his spirit and his learning will be here all throughout our, our presentations today. So I probably could spend the whole time just talking about why students need to be active, but I'm assuming if you signed up for this webinar that you already see the many benefits. So one of the things I just wanted to say is here are four of the probably 4,000 reasons why we want students to be active in our classrooms that when students are active, engagement soars. And I've been in schools recently, and I feel like one of the number one things people are talking about is how do we get more and more students to be actively engaged? That is something we will talk about throughout our time together tonight. We also know that when students are active, it leads to more transfer, that it creates a more student-centered classroom, and it leads to that deeper understanding and knowing that we want students to actually develop that expertise. Like I said, there's way more than that, but I wanted to just sort of start with a little bit of our why. And when I think about this idea of what it means to actively learn, I wanna frame it in these three ways. So it means that we're physically active, emotionally active and intellectually active. So we're gonna take a few minutes here in the beginning to go through a teeny tiny bit of the research in each of those three areas. And then the rest of our time is going to be really about like what are some actual methods, some of which are maybe tried and true that you've done before. And I might just offer a slight tweak or confirmation on something you're doing and some of which might be newer for you. So I'm gonna invite you during our time together to look for confirmations and look for new ideas or slight tweaks to what you've already been doing. So when we think about physically active, I'm a super nerd and I'm also an athlete. And one of the things that I've just been fascinated about is the field of embodied cognition. If you don't know what embodied cognition is, it's a whole field that studies how the physicality of our body shapes the way we learn. And here's just one teeny tiny example of that um, that I wanna say, if you would like to, if you I had to actually go and get a pen or pencil, but if you have one, take a moment and try this. So just put it in your mouth to force yourself to smile for about 10 seconds. I'm not punking you or anything like that. The reason why I just asked you to do that is research and embodied cognition has found that forcing yourself to smile in this way, and especially by putting a pencil in your mouth and forcing yourself to smile, actually increases happiness levels. And in some studies, in the same amount as taking antidepressant drugs. I am not here in any way to be anti-antidepressants or to tell you to stop taking antidepressant drugs, but I wanted to highlight that study that this comes from a larger body that the way we physically move our bodies impacts the way we feel and the way we think. 
And so we could spend our whole time today thinking just about how do we get students physically moving. It will be woven in in smaller ways, but I just wanted to acknowledge that one little bit. If you're interested in more, um, I'm gonna give my email address at the end and I'm happy to share some other really powerful resources if you wanna nerd out around embodied cognition. We also know that learning needs to happen when students are emotionally active. And you might know about mirror neurons, but in case you don't, mirror neurons are the part of our neurology that makes us cry at the movies. I just finished binge watching a season of um, Firefly Lane, I believe it's called. I don't even remember. I'm sobbing. My mother came in, I was saying with my mother and she's like, are you okay, Gravity? And I said, yes, I just need to feel these feelings for a moment. Not spoiler there if anyone's watching that show, but maybe most of us, according to this study, 82% of us actually cry at the movies or when we view something that brings that emotional response, even though we know the sad thing is not happening to us. This is because our brains and bodies have mirror neurons, which are our adaptation that when we see somebody else experience something emotional, it actually mirrors the same response in our own physiology. So when we think about this actively learning, it's not just cognitive, which we're going to talk a lot about today. It has this physical and emotional element to it. Probably not surprising, we know that when students have any sort of emotional attachment to the material they are studying, they are much more likely to actually retain it and remember it. There's a big connection between emotion and memory. When we think about intellectual um, active activity and intellectually thinking about how we actively engage, there are lots of different types of thinking we could focus on, but for today, I wanna focus on these four. These are four that from my own research and my own experience in the past, you know, I guess 23 years, I think I've been a teacher now. Um, I've noticed these are four that require a lot of attention if we wanna help students develop them. So one is independent thinking. And I think we've always needed to support this in our students, but especially now this idea of forming their own opinion based on their own beliefs, knowledge, and experience, the ability to think for oneself. Another type of thinking is creative thinking, that ability to not just imagine what already exists, but to imagine possibilities beyond what already exists. We also could think about problem solving thinking. That's the ability to not just recognize a challenge and feel like you can actually work towards resolving it, but developing possible solutions, seeing yourself as an active problem solver. And then finally, we have empathetic thinking. The idea of like that, it's part of my responsibility to not just seek to know answers, but seek to know people's feelings and experiences. And really just defining empathy, not as necessarily believing what somebody else believes or feeling what somebody else believes. It not, doesn't mean we have to change our own minds. It just means that we understand that somebody else has their own worldview and set of feelings and beliefs. Even if we don't agree with them, it's the ability to recognize that. So these four types of thinking do not stand separate, right, from our emotional and our physical activity in the classroom, right? All of them are interwoven together. For the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on these four, and I'm going to take us through some different methods that really weave through multiple pieces together, because what we want are high leverage instructional strategies, high leverage instructional methods that don't just isolate one of these at a time. I'm also gonna give examples from across disciplines and everything I'm presenting here is something that can be adapted, revised, or used immediately, no matter what subject area that you teach. So in the research for um, writing the book, Active Learning, one of the things that we did was we started to break down these different teaching routines or methods and really look closely at how do they align with these different types of thinking. And at first, what our hunch was like, oh, we'll be able to have some of them align with some parts of thinking. But anything that made it into our 40, which we're not going to get to over all 40 now, there's 40 in our book, but we're going to go over several tonight, absolutely can support all these different types of thinking. And I think in this time of feeling like we're all time crunched, of really trying to capitalize on student engagement and attention, we want to pick these high leverage strategies that actually do multiple things at one time. So from there, we said, okay, we have these different types of thinking. We want students physically, emotionally, intellectually active. What do we need to consider? And so we recognize these seven areas. Nothing on this slide 
is anything new or groundbreaking. They're almost like the containers that these methods and strategies fit within. So we first thought about instructional structures. What does a classroom and a week in a unit look like? And then we started to think within that, like what are the actual teaching moves? And then after our teaching, of course, what are the learning tools and the collaboration structures? We started this book pre-COVID and had to reimagine a lot of the learning tools and collaboration structures in a current and post, depending on how we're defining it, um, COVID context, because we recognize these are areas that students needed much more explicit support in. We also recognize, and my background is in literacy, but that actually reading and writing is embedded in all of these content areas. And there are a core just couple routines that would help every teacher having in their pocket to be able to support students across disciplines. And then finally, we know that assessment matters and that we want to assess in ways that get kids actively um, thinking and leaning in so that our assessments are real portrayals of what students um, know and can do. So the whole rest of our time, I'm going to present several of these, um, not all of them, I can't do all 40, um, but several that you can try right away. So the first one we're going to look at is reflection. So remember I said you're going to hear some things that are confirming. I'm sure it's not brand new to a single person on this webinar that reflection is something that you heard of, tried, maybe regularly use, but I want to dive a little bit deeper. In order to make reflection something meaningful and actively engaging for students, it can be helpful to think about it in these three phases. What's the work that happens before the reflection, during the reflection and learning, and then afterward? And so what I found is that sometimes we really privilege the after part, but if we forget about the before and during, there's a lot of like, I did a good job or I struggled with, and it's sort of vague and not always as targeted and as possible. So by actually mapping it out like this and breaking down our teaching into before the learning, what's the kind of reflection? I can name a goal. Do I know what success looks like? Can I name those characteristics? Can I picture it? Do I know what it sounds like? Then are we reminding students and giving them opportunities while they're learning and working to go back to that goal? Are they asking themselves some reflective questions, which I'm gonna show in just a moment on the next slide? And are we giving them enough contemplative time to actually check in with themselves to really do the reflection? Because we know reflection can't happen when there's a lot of noise and, and lots going on. And then finally, afterward, a lot of the times at the end of reflection, it can be really helpful for students to share with somebody else who authentically cares about how their learning is going, whether that is a teacher or a peer, but also using that reflection to name the next step, to recognize that I can be proud of where I am, but that it also can propel me forward. So if we look at some of these self-reflection questions, my husband is an educator and a lot of these came from the work that he did and we tested these out and he actually did a lot of work in math too, which is not always the area that I personally work in. Um, so I'm not gonna read all these questions to you, but you might skim them and recognize some of these that you think, oh good, I can easily incorporate this or I already do. And some of these that maybe you haven't asked your students that you might try before. Like I love this one about, two thirds of the way down, what helps me get started or persevere during challenges? There's an assumption there that you are somebody who perseveres through challenges and can you name specifically how you do that, right? Or this last one, what tools do I need that we're not waiting for the adult to hand us a tool, but that that's part of the job of a learner is to recognize the tools that help me or the tools that would be helpful. And if you have students, many of which I've worked with that have trouble even knowing how to answer a question like this, because of lack of experience maybe, or just enough practice, then that second chart I have at the smaller one is just an example of a few sentence starters that it can be really helpful to really put here some language that you might use to do this reflection side by side with these questions. Here's the thing, and I'm seeing people in the chat agreeing and, and adding on to these ideas. Reflection doesn't work if it only happens once in a while. This becomes a core routine that we build in, whether we're doing collaborative work or independent work, that it's something that becomes a core routine in our classroom. And it doesn't need to eat up lots and lots of time. I explicitly teach how to reflect early on, and then students get that repeated practice. It's also a way for students to emotionally connect with one another because they start to recognize they are not the only one who is persevering or the only one who needs support. Sometimes I do it in a Google form digitally. 
it's really nice to do it one on one and talk to students or have them do some writing. But we can also just create a quick Google um, form. And then we get that information regularly. I was just in a high school English teacher's classroom. She had some students doing this at the end of her class. And the next day she started her teaching by mirroring and naming some of the reflections, the strengths and the next steps that students themselves were saying. It's a really quick way to get a pulse on the class. So I'd love to show what this looks like in a conversation, in a coaching conversation with a student, because ideally this is where they really learn to do the reflection. Yes, we can model it. Yes, I can put up questions. I can put up prompts. Um, I can embed it in a regular basis, but at the least at the beginning, having a side-by-side -side conversation really shows students the idea that we can really um, listen and lean in and that we are invested in their reflection. So we're gonna watch just the beginning of a couple minute conversation here, which I try regularly to meet with all the students one-on-one -on -one in conversations like this. So Cameron, we just started this new focus on reading nonfiction informational texts. And you know, as a class, we've been reading aloud um, some different nonfiction texts and we just went over those goals that we have for the whole class. And today I thought we could take some time together for you to set a goal for yourself on what's something that you think yourself as a reader would be something you wanna to work toward. So let's just look back at the chart that we made as a class to remind ourselves what those goals are. So remember we said when we synthesize or put our ideas together across texts, we can set a goal to think across more than one text. We can set a goal to write in a reading notebook across more than one text. We can set a goal to talk across more than one text, or we can set a goal to remember we should draw those conclusions or big ideas. Yeah. So let's take a few minutes for you to think about what's something that's already a strength of something you know how to do as a reader and how we can build a goal from that. So what's something as a nonfiction reader that you already feel like you know how to do that's a strength from there? I think I can, uh, I can think across different texts. Yeah, can you give an example of a time like that or something you've done like that? Um, like, like where you've was, read like two books and you saw a connection across those two? Um, like I read two books about, there was one about a king that made a lion contest Okay. to entertain himself. Hmm. But then at the end, someone said, I, came here to collect the money I gave to the king, but the king said that was a lie, so he won the money. And so he was Sounds trying like a to twist. be greedy. Okay, okay. so and you then, read that one book, and how does that connect to another book you read? There was another book where a man only had a stale bread and soup. So the man went in the trailer where he was cooking the soup and smelled the soup. The, man, the cook caught him, sent him to court. The judge, said, I will pay pay you the sound of money and took two pennies and rubbed them together. Whoa, so in these two fiction stories that were totally different plots, you saw a connection between the two of those? Yes. So you're recognizing that when you read fiction books, you can do that thinking across text. So maybe that you could do some of that work when you're reading nonfiction too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a strength that you have. What's something you think from those goals that's something you don't do a lot or is a challenge for you that you might want to work on? Um, uh, writing it down in a reading notebook. Okay, so what's the challenge there for you? It's like, I would read and then uh, sometimes I can't like remember all of the things that happened because like most of the time I'm reading big like chapter books. So I'm not able to like remember what happened in each chapter. So if I write it down, I can know what happened from chapter to chapter. So in your I'm gonna stop us there and just say, so I go on to help him with that goal um, in that conference and help him have a strategy for writing that down. I just wanted to give an example of what this looks like in conversation. Now, obviously it's not feasible to do this all the time. We're always sitting and having a six minute conversation one-on-one -on -one with students, but the longevity of this, right? The relationship we built, the way we're actively leaning in, but also now we can go back to that over time. So just having a few questions, asking them, and people often say, how do you get kids to open up of any age? And I always say, 
being genuinely interested. This is a fourth grader in this particular example, um, but I ask the similar kinds of questions to second graders and to 12th graders. And I think as long as they recognize you are genuinely interested and not trying to turn reflection into a grading and an evaluation experience, they almost always lean right in in that way. But I will say that's where having those, those um, sentence stems to help with the language can be helpful for students who also need help just knowing how to answer those questions. So connecting this to those four types of thinking. So we can see, and you might be thinking about this too, how reflection is helping him independently think for himself. But any kinds of reflection helps someone get clear on what are the ways you think personally and how might you go in a slightly different direction or add to what you're doing. It helps with creative thinking because when you're reflecting, you can recognize patterns, habits, ruts that you're in and help yourself to challenge yourself or imagine your way into a different possibility. It also can help with problem solving thinking. Oftentimes students bring problems or challenges to the reflection and that's a part of the invitation is what is something that's a challenge for you that we can work on. And then for empathetic thinking, I think just this idea that we normalize that everybody has strengths and everybody has challenges allows us to not be so afraid to name them and to be vulnerable enough to talk about what are our feelings and experiences as learners. So a second method we're gonna talk about, so we just talked about reflection. A second one of these methods is um, a collaboration structure of share outs. So this is to me like one of the low hanging fruits of collaboration that we sometimes don't see enough of, which is students actually sharing and being the teacher for the rest of the class. So I tend to do this either midway through an instructional period or at the end of a period or at the end of a week, anytime there's sort of a natural pause for students to take on some of the teaching to share with others in the class what they're learning and how it's going. One, for one, I feel like students sometimes would just like say it better to their peers than I do. It's more relatable. But I think the second part of that is the student doing the sharing learns so much from that experience. So the first thing I do is teach them before you share, I don't wanna put anyone on the spot and like cold call on them. Like now you teach the class what you just did. I wanna give them a strategy for how to get ready to share. And this share could be in a small group. It could be even just with one other peer or it could be in front of the whole class depending on many variables and what students are comfortable with. So one of the things that we might do is say, first, you need to think about what you're gonna share. Then choose something to show. Is it a visual? Is it a piece of work? So you're not just talking at your classmates, right? And then you might want to think a little bit, what were your steps? What was the process you used? Because that's the part that can translate to others who are learning from you. So one of the things that we can then do is put up some kind of chart like this that lets students know when you share, show an example, explain your process or steps, and reflect on what you learned. So it's sort of taking that reflection from the first part, but now making it a lot more public so that everybody gets the benefit of that learning. And some of the kinds of share outs that we might choose to, to use are on this right now. So it might be that we share ideas, we might share strategies, we might share challenges. That's one of my favorite days when we just share out like, what are, what are challenges for us right now? Because to hear that every single student, even that student that everyone is shocked has a challenge can be so powerful. We can share a question if we're in a class inquiry. We can share tools that students are using and how they're helping them. We can share a misstep and something like, oh yeah, I did not mean to do this or this did not work and here's what I learned. And we can share feedback and how we use that feedback, especially because we know that when we're giving feedback all the times to students, um, it can be challenging for them to sometimes think about how did you actually use that feedback? So making it more public in a share out gives them the space to think about that. Um, an example of a misstep might be um, choosing the wrong kind of algorithm to sound a math problem. It might be um, miscomprehending a text that they were used. It might be that they were in um, a collaborative conversation and they just talked over everybody. Um, so I, I think it is in some ways the word failure. I think someone just put in the chat, but it's maybe a softer way of saying rather than it's a total failure, it was just like, okay, that did not work. And how can I learn from that? Thanks for asking the question. If you pop a question in there, I can quickly answer. I can do that. Great. 
So if we think about share outs and how they connect to being actively engaged as thinkers, because we can spot like different students, great, and I'm loving that people are talking about in different disciplines that can look like error analysis and things like that. Um, the independent thinking is the sort of reflection that you're doing to even be ready to do the sharing. The creative thinking, it's very interesting to see how students choose to share with one another. And especially the older students that I work with are very sometimes, um, I don't want to say critical, but they will point out to one another, you didn't give us an example, or we need a visual for that. There's a way in which they then start to be creative and how do they teach their peers in a way that they will actually learn from one another. The problem solving piece, that's often what students are choosing to share out is a problem and how they solved it. And then again, the empathetic thinking is that we're all in this community together, having a range of experiences and feelings. And part of our job is to show up with that and bring that into the learning experience and to share that part of it too. Sometimes the share is simply, yeah, I didn't, I didn't do this work. It felt way too overwhelming for me. And finally, I at least got myself started and here's how I got myself started. So it's not even always the end result. It could even be just part of the learning process that we're sharing with one another. So let's think a little bit about reading routines as another method we might think about. So almost every subject area, there's this ability to identify central ideas. You might not call it that in every subject area, but most of the time when we're reading, we have to be able to distinguish between these tiny details and the big central ideas in the text. And I'm just gonna speak for myself, but I also work with lots of teachers who have sort of nodded when I've shared this lesson with them or this method with them, which is that I think that sometimes we have misunderstood what central ideas are. And sometimes me as a teacher and others as a teacher might be why students struggle with that. That there's actually three parts to identifying main or central ideas. And a lot of times we only teach students the first two. And I'll, again, I shouldn't say we, I'll say I. And it took me a while to realize I needed to lean more into the third. So if we were to break this routine into three parts, the first thing I have to do as I'm reading, and I'm gonna say reading could also be reading an image. It could be reading a video, reading a podcast, reading in the broadest terms here, right? I'm trying to understand some sort of created text. First, I have to identify what's the general topic, right? What's this about? And if you look at the example here, I was reading the book um, Top Dog and I recognized the topic was motivation. So I modeled that for students. Then the second part is as I'm reading this part of the text, I have to identify what's the specific category or part of the topic. That when we are reading things that are teaching us, they never, it's not like everything about motivation in this chapter. The category it was focusing on was competition. Sometimes, especially in um, less complex text, it says it right in the heading. So it's not really that hard for students to figure out. Sometimes it doesn't. And so there is a degree of inference, right, of being able to say. So I'm seeing people in the chat saying a concept or a subtopic totally. It's the, the ability for students to read and understand that the topic is this big, but here is the sub or the category. I don't really matter to me what you call it, but the smaller specific part that this part of the text is focusing on. A lot of students think that's the main or central idea, that the central idea is really about how people are motivated by competition. But really, it's called the central or main idea because it has to have an idea. And so missing this part three can be a real challenge. So the third part is then to read what did the author say about this topic and category? And how do I put that into an idea? In this visual, I don't have it bulleted out. Sometimes I also model bulleting out or webbing out the details around the category to help students see that. So you can see here an example of a central idea is some people suffer and are less motivated by competition and perform poorly in competitive events. So it has a topic, a category, and an idea in it. So there's a lot of teaching that actually goes into students being able to do this, which is why many of them struggle, get these questions wrong in standardized tests, or are confused about what to take notes on, or seem to just miss the whole like big idea of what we're talking about when they're asked to read independently, no matter the subject area. So I wanna backtrack now that you have sort of have a sense of what I mean by these central ideas and think about what's some of the teaching that goes into that. Well, if I want students to be actively engaged, it can be helpful to give them some choice. 
And one of the choices they might have, even if they're all reading the same text, although we of course could also give them some choice of text when it's appropriate, is what's your purpose for reading your text? So if you're reading true stories, here might be some of your purposes and allowing students to do that because that's gonna shape the way they read for central ideas based on their purpose for reading. If instead of reading true stories, if they're reading news as an example, then they might have a different set of purposes that they're choosing from. But having charts up like this in the classroom before reading allows students to say, what is my purpose for reading? Why am I reading this? And that's gonna help me read a little bit more closely and caring enough to get those central ideas. Many of the students that I work with also struggle with just understanding the different types of nonfiction, and they read all of it the same. So it's really hard for them to distinguish that topic and category and idea part when they're reading it all as if it's the exact same kind of text. So breaking it down, although there's way more than three categories, of course, but even just breaking it down into three main types of nonfiction, that there's narrative, which is those you know, true story nonfiction, and when I read that, what's gonna help me figure out the central ideas are timelines, photograph, descriptions, et cetera. Having a chart up like this to let them know, oh, this is the type of nonfiction, this is what I'm gonna look for. Or I'm reading expository nonfiction. It's not a story, it's gonna be those um, headings and subheadings, right? So I'm gonna look for different elements of the text to help me. Or am I reading persuasive nonfiction? I need to be looking for claims and counterclaims and data and statistics. So one of the things we can do with quick formative assessment is put a nonfiction text, whether it's auditory, print, or um, video in front of students and ask them to think through central ideas and notice, are they even thinking about the type of text it is and how it's set up? Once they have a purpose, they know the type of text and they know what to pay attention to, then the last thing that I think is super important is that they have a way to take notes. Now, not notes because they're taking a test is the only reason I take notes or for a grade because someone's gonna collect it, but that when I do even a little bit of writing, it helps my thinking, which is why I showed that example from Top Dog of just how I figured out the central idea. It wasn't a lot of words on that slide, on that example, but authentically showing students that even adult proficient readers write things down to help us understand those big ideas. And so one of the things we might do is teach them, depending on how the text is set up, we can take notes in a different way. So if it's a series of events, it's a timeline or a story mountain or storyboard to take my notes. If it's categories like expository, I might use box and bullets or a web or sticky notes. If it's persuasive, then I might use a three column charts or I might use a four quadrant. And I'll just show some examples here of being able to see how two different students in the same class, oops, why is this not popping up? Um, took notes in very different ways based on the text that they were reading. And so this shows me not only are they gonna be able to then put this together to eventually synthesize for those central ideas, but also it shows that they are thinking about the way the text is organizing and set up. So these are just a few examples of the kinds of charts that I would be putting up and teaching into and modeling so that students understand this central idea, which is gonna come up in science when they read anything in science, in social studies, in an English classroom, but it also might come up in surprising ways in a math or a health or even a PE class when we listen to what's the central idea of this game. So again, if we connect this ability to identify central ideas to the different types of thinking, we know there isn't, and I forgot to say this in the beginning, Yes, totally, someone's saying reading a math book is different than reading a novel and they need to know how to approach it differently, 100%. Um, that I purposely put central ideas plural and that's because they're, even though on a standardized test that has multiple choice, they will tell you, you know, what is the main idea or what is the central idea and you have to pick one. In the world, we're not going to necessarily all agree that it's all the same central idea. So that independent thinking is that there's a degree of inference embedded within here that I myself as an independent thinker bring to the text. I creatively am putting the details together of how I take my notes, how I think. I'm solving a problem to which I have to figure out not just what I think the central idea is, but the problem in, in essence isn't like a problem, like a bad thing, but like a challenge of how do I read this text? No two readers are ever gonna read it in the exact same way. 
And then the empathetic thinking comes in when we share our process and also just this idea that who we are shapes the ideas that pop up to us. So again, I could get in way more detail of the way this supports all the different types of thinking, but it helps me realize that something that might seem like, oh, that's a one and done quick thing, identifying central ideas, if we take the time to teach it as a process, leads to a whole bunch of active engagement in student thinking. Another reading routine that I sort of added in because it's been coming up so much in the schools that I support and the teachers, um, just with some social studies teachers last week were asking all about this was learning new vocabulary. So sometimes learning new vocabulary, to be honest with you, and I'll say this from my own experience, can be devoid of activity. It feels like looking things up and memorizing and copying definitions. That's not really the kind of research-based learning new vocabulary I wanna talk about today. How do we make learning new vocabulary more active for students when we think about physically, emotionally, intellectually active? So I'm just gonna present a few ideas here. So one is, so this is an example of a chart where students self-select which of the small group lessons that they would like to participate in based on their own self-reflection and their own goals of what they feel like they need to work more on. So is it using context clues? Is it using word parts? Is it using references? Is it collecting and organizing words? Maybe they are recognizing a lot of words that are new for them, but they don't know what to do with them. And the good thing about this is none of this is a bad, like even if a student makes a choice that wouldn't be the choice I made for them, they're gonna be more actively engaged because they are saying and selecting and enrolling in, this is the group I wanna be a part of. And of course you can rotate through so students can be in more than one. If you're lucky enough to be in a co-taught classroom, you could turn this into stations, of course, too. So here are just three ways um, that we can teach students to be more actively engaged in vocabulary study. So it could be that you organize words by topic. Really simple, basic. I learned this from a bilingual teacher years and years ago, and I, I can't say that it's ever done me wrong. Make a simple A to Z, and as students are studying, whether that is from lectures, videos, readings, discussions, inquiries, explorations, they start to track the words, and they have a collection. Now, the thing about this collection is the only way they are organized is by this larger topic. If you wanted to add some nuance to it, instead you could have students collect and organize words by category, or maybe they take the A to Z organization and then they sort it from there. And so this could be an example, and I'm sorry that I'm using rats, which I know for some people is a, <laughs> is a trigger animal, but I really just had a student who was in an inquiry project around rats. And he started to collect words, and then he noticed he could organize them around survival words, relationship to people word, food words, reputation words, right? And so just the idea that we're starting to organize by category means they have to understand these words beyond the literal, I memorize the definition, right? And then we can also think about how we can organize words by tone. This is really helpful if we want students to actually use the words, not just recognize and understand them, but then put them to use in a debate or public speaking or in some kind of writing piece, right? That which words have a hopeful tone versus a fearful tone or a disappointed tone or an urgent tone. And so these are just a few examples of how collecting, organizing, sorting, comparing, contrasting words makes them much more actively engaging. And if you have more than one student or a class of students who are working on this together, they get really interested and engaged in, well, where did you sort your word? And I've seen, for example, like, seventh grade boys in May who were checked out of everything, seriously debating if a word belonged in one column or another. And so it's sort of like that gamifying it in a way. And the goal, of course, is not just to all agree. The goal is to look at the nuance of words and to actively engage with it. So here are a few examples. You can go well beyond this, but we know that one of the ways that the brain learns language is by comparing and contrasting. And so sorting is a great way to do that. They can literally sort in a notebook. I've seen teachers put it on jam boards, lots of different ways we can make this physically um, active too. So again, we can think about how understanding vocabulary can lead to independent thinking of like, where, which words are you personally selecting and where do you put them? To creative thinking and like, what are the categories you are creating and how are you designing the words um, and ways that they go together? To problem solving thinking like, this idea of like which words are actually important enough to look up and write down. You have to decide that. And also which words do you think you might use and where would you use them and who would you use them with? 
right? Gets all that engagement happening. And then the empathetic thinking, especially if we lean into the tone piece, we start to say, if I use this word, how is somebody going to experience this piece of writing differently than if I use this one? So there tends to be like, right, this sense of audience and that word choice matters, which we also know is in most state standards. We're gonna jump to writing. So we talked about reading. Now we're gonna talk about writing a little bit. Again, something that seems like the domain of English, but certainly we ask students to write in some capacity in almost every class. So years ago when I was a special educator, one of the things that I noticed was that students who planned before they wrote always had better pieces of writing. And yet the vast majority of students resisted planning, especially if it was long drawn out outlining, you know, they would rather do almost anything than do that. And I started to recognize that maybe we needed to open up and engage students more. And what does planning and, and really rehearsing, because that's what a plan is, for writing look like? What could it be? And I started to realize, like, even myself and my friends who are adult writers, like, sometimes we just daydream. Sometimes planning for writing looks like staring out the window, but I'm actually thinking through how it goes. Sometimes it's physically acting it out. Um, sometimes it's sketching, sometimes it's building, like getting unifix cubes or Legos or blocks or something to physically build sometimes can help. Sometimes it's telling, like getting a partner and I'm just gonna need to talk it through with you. Sometimes it's visually storyboarding. But when we started to open up that planning could look different and have different modalities, it didn't become this like, oh, you're gonna make me plan. It instead was which form of planning is gonna work for this kind of writing and work for me as a learner. And so I'll just say, I, I presented just this one slide in like a whole hour long presentation. Um, and a ninth grade teacher sent me a video of his class the next week, he tried it immediately. And it was amazing to see there were students building things. There were students in a corner talking to one another. There were students who looked like they were spacing out dreaming. There were students sketching and writing all within the classroom. And it was just in some ways, just giving permission that planning could look at like a variety of ways. It just has to work for you. So I also tend to think about for the people who need a little bit of a harder sell on this, that in life, not everyone's going to become a writer. But in life, all of us are going to have to plan things. I just planned my kid's fifth birthday party. I did a, a lot of the talking, a lot of the sketching, some of the building. I mean, all of these came in, right? So if we think about it in this way, like sports teams, building planners, even if we're just thinking about um, people who are in theater, even rehearsals, like what am I gonna wear tomorrow and trying on an outfit in front of the mirror, right? That like when we teach students that when we plan or rehearse in this way, they're much more willing to do it. And the writing is almost always better, right? I think for some of us teachers, the hesitancy can be like, will they actually do it? And I think the proof is in the pudding when they start to do it. And right, I'm seeing people put like the, the choice, the autonomy, how important that is. They recognize their peers who did the planning are doing better in the writing and they usually get more into it. And also just to say one more thing, as a teacher, I do not want to read 110 of the same outline and the same essay. So it also creates some like freedom and playfulness for me as an educator to open up the face of what planning could look like. So again, we can see how this can tie into creating independent thinkers. I need to know myself well enough to know like, how am I going to plan and rehearse that's going to work for me? My gifts, my challenges, who I am as a learner. I can be creative. There was lots of different ways we can like physically build or create or someone who wants to write, of course, can still do that. The problem solving piece is I also need to match the way that I write to the challenges of this writing or speaking task. That it's not always a one size fits all even for me that I love to sketch, so I always sketch. Maybe this piece of writing requires something else. So I have to sort of do that problem solving and matching. And then the empathetic piece too is when we're in community together, there's a like, this is fun and playful for all of us, but we recognize that like my perspective isn't the only one. And while sketching might be awesome for me, my best bud or my writing partner might have a totally different perspective on sketching and they get to choose something else. So we normalize the fact that our learning looks different for different people. Finally, we can think about assessment opportunities. And we can think about 
learning progressions as one way we assess. Now, in some ways, I can't believe I picked learning progression as the assessment opportunity that I wanted to share with you tonight because we could spend days just on this one topic. So in case there's folks who don't know as much about learning progressions, I wanna just take a minute or two to define that and then we can get into the nuance of it. So a learning progression is just that. It takes a concept or a skill that we want students to develop and we look at a progression from least experienced and proficient to most experienced and proficient. And we try to like name the pathway of how that skill develops. So here's an example of one that some social studies teachers and I developed for supporting claims with evidence. But I think you can even see here and realize this would work beyond just social studies. This is just an example of a progression. So what we noticed was students who were really novice at this could identify parts of the text that supported their claim. Like they had highlighted or knew what that was. But then one step up from that was they could not just identify, but they could contextualize it. Like here's a piece of evidence and here's the context that it exists. Once they could do that, like one step up was they could also explain it and explain how it connected to the claim. So here's the evidence, here's the context, and here's how it connects. For some students just getting there, we're like, woohoo, we made so much growth but you have students who are entering there. So a step up from that is they're now starting to synthesize from multiple places in the text doing that. And then finally, students who are really um, expert in this skill, they can do all of those things and they explain whose voices or perspectives are missing. So it's not just the evidence that's there in the text, but also the evidence that maybe is missing. So how this works, there's lots of different ways. It could be a self-reflection tool where we think about assessment as self-assessment where I as a student look at my work and I identify where am I on here and I can name, all right, here's a strength of what I can do, but then also I can look just one step to the right to start to think about what's the next step for myself. Or teachers could look at student work, group students who are in the same um, area of the learning progression and then teach them all together in small groups by differentiating what's one step next to the right. Or this could be used as a formal assessment tool, which isn't always just for instruction, but as a summative assessment also to say, maybe you assess in the beginning, here's where you started, you assess at the end, and you can assess being able to name growth. So maybe there's a student who came in all the way at the left and was able to, by the end, like end up in the middle. They haven't mastered it yet, but it acknowledges the growth. And I'll just say one more piece of why I believe learning progressions are so important is that I don't think it's helpful for teachers or students to just say, check, they understood or they didn't, or they got it right or they got it wrong. Neither of those actually tells me what to teach next. When I create and use learning progressions, I always know what to teach next, unless I have a student who got all the way to the right, in which case I'm gonna just focus on a different skill. So it becomes a tool for everybody to dispel, like what does success look like into a really clear progression. If you're wondering how to make them, it's a lot of doing the work ourselves and looking at student work and sort of sorting it from least proficient to most and trying to name that. So here's how we make it actually active because it could be easy to just put this out and students use it like a rubric and ignore it or sort of mindlessly go through the motions. But here are a bunch of different ways. And by the way, this is with learning progression, but you also could do these with rubrics also. So we could do an example sort where we have some student work and they sort them based on where they would put them on the learning progression. It could be that as a class, we create examples together. Let's create an example of what the second column would look like. It could be that we um, put up an example and we annotate it together really noticing and naming strengths. It could be that we put it up together and we notice and name next steps. We could revise something together. We could say, this is like the third row, I'm um, sorry, the third column, like let's try to get it to the fourth. Let's work together as a class or in small groups. How might we revise this? It could be used for goal setting, right? Where students can say, here's where I am and here's where I wanna be by the end of this unit or the end of this project. And it can be used for peer feedback. A lot of times peer feedback looks like good job or way to go or a nod. But when I put this in front of students, they often then can say, here's where you are. Let's talk about how do you move one next to one another. It gives language to the, the peers together. 
and it gives them something specific to look at. So some of these examples that I use were with, you know, argument writing and social studies, but you could use this with any formative assessment. You can build in these different activities to make it something actually active that students will engage with. So we talked today about reflection. We talked about share outs. We talked about central ideas, vocabulary, planning and rehearsing for writing and using learning progressions, right? So those are just a handful. It is May. If you take even one of those and feel confirmation and one of those is something you're excited to try, I feel like that is a great place for May 8th, I believe it is today. But I wanna also situate this in a larger, why does this matter? So we want our students to be engaged in our classrooms. I think that goes without saying. But if we actually support students in a K to 12 setting, really developing independent thinking, creative thinking, problem solving thinking, and empathetic thinking, we are actually preparing them to be citizen scholars and performers in the world beyond school. What I mean by citizens is not someone who just votes, which that is super important, of course, on voting day, but people who can be empathetic, who can hear multiple perspectives, who can be creative and try to solve some of the many local and global problems and challenges that we have. We need people coming up with all, we need problem solving thinking tomorrow, right? So it's not something we can pass on. When I say developing scholars, I don't just mean people who go to formal university to study, but somebody who is a lifelong learner, somebody who's willing to think regularly in whatever domain they choose to study and live in whatever profession they go in. And then finally, we need people to be performers. And I don't just mean, when I mean performer, I don't just mean somebody who gets up on a stage or starts an amazing you know, viral TikTok. I just mean somebody who knows how to act in the world, who takes big ideas or even small ideas and takes action. So when we imagine these active learning spaces, yes, on the short term, we get more engagement in our classroom. But on the long run, we're actually developing the kinds of citizen scholars and performers that our communities need. And I think that to me is the bigger sell on May 8th. So I'm gonna start to wrap us up. If people have specific questions that you'd like to share, please put them in the chat if I didn't get a chance to answer them. But I'm started with reflection and I'm also just gonna end with a little reflection that maybe everyone in the chat who's welcome to do this to maybe name one thing that was confirming for you and maybe one thing you might wanna try. The reason to put it in the chat is just, it gets you to do that extra level of reflection. If you have to go, I understand that too. And I just would be remiss if I didn't say, my website and my email and my Twitter handle are all on the bottom. If you feel like you have to run or you're watching this as a recording and you wanted to ask a question, feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, info at corwin.com. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, be well and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.